Fantasia. So Fantasia came out in 1940 and is the third full-length animated feature to be produced by Walt Disney. And while his first two feature films are animated retellings of classic fairy tales, Fantasia is a horse of a different color. It actually has more in common with a philharmonic orchestral concert than a traditional Hollywood film. And that's because at this time, Walt Disney didn't really want to make just another feature film. He wanted to make, in his own words, a visual concert where his animators would listen to various types of classical music and animate visuals based on what they were hearing without the use of any mind-altering substances, I'm sure. But as for how they went about animating these various pieces, they found that pretty much all the numbers fell into one of three camps. It was either program music, which is music that has a definite story that it's telling, with a plot and everything, or absolute music, which is music that exists purely for its own sake, that really has no plot or character or story, and is far more abstract in nature. But then you have ones that fall right in the middle that may not really have a plot, but definitely conjure up images and elements that definitely are representational. So let's dive right in and see how they did. Well, the first thing you might notice about Fantasia is that the beginning part isn't animated. In fact, a substantial portion of this is live action. And they film these live action bits to really give you a feeling that you're watching the orchestra. And they show a full orchestra complete with conductor and announcer. And even though it's not the most exciting introduction, it does give you that kind of concert hall feel. But the first actual animated segment is the Toccata in Fugue, which is a piece of absolute music, which means this segment is completely in the abstract. There's no story, there's no characters. You're just watching some very pretty animation with abstract shapes, maybe some references to the instrumentation. But for the most part, it's just pretty backdrops and shapes and colors and abstract art. And this is a warning sign for the rest of the movie because of slow classical music that's very drawn out, puts you right to sleep, and I'm guilty of that too, this is going to be a rough two hours. And the Takata and Fugue segment is easily the least interesting part of the entire movie. And unless you're really into classical music and or the art of animation, the segment is going to do nothing for you. And even as a fan of animation, it doesn't really do a whole lot for me. So let's move on right along to the next segment. It's the Nutcracker Suite. So this is when things start to pick up a little bit, but not really. There's still a lot of long, very pretty, and very just beautiful scenes of animation and music. The music, of course, is fantastic. It's Nutcracker. But the pacing of this segment is incredibly slow. It starts out with fairies creating dewdrops on a spider web and then advances to the changing of seasons. And there's really only two moments where it really starts to pick up the energy, and it's with the dancing Asian mushrooms and the dancing Russian flowers. It might offend some people, but they're really the only moments where I kind of perk up and I'm like, oh, things are happening. There's things. Things are moving pretty fast and with a lot of energy until it slows right back down with falling leaves. But now let's skip ahead to some actual full-on program music that tells a story with a plot and everything, The Sorcerer's Apprentice. And you know what? There's a reason why they brought back The Sorcerer's Apprentice in Fantasia 2000, because this is actually a really good segment. It's the first time we ever see Sorcerer Mickey, and I'm just going to call him Merlin. And this segment is animated beautifully. It's got fantastic shadow work. It's got a pretty brisk pace. Mickey goes from experimenting with a broom to creating the multiverse in just a few minutes. And we maybe get some subtle foreshadowing of Chernabog, you know, the devil on Bald Mountain that shows up later. At least I hope that's foreshadowing and not just a bat. Maybe I'm reaching, I just really want there to be some continuity in this movie. But what can I say, The Sorcerer's Apprentice is a classic Disney short. It's memorable, it's fun, it's lighthearted, but it also has a really good moral about not abusing power and just being responsible. But after that masterpiece, we go on to Rite of Spring, and I like the part with the dinosaurs. And if you're honest with yourself, that's the only part that you care about, too. And it really is a shame that the dinosaurs only take up a small fraction of the entire Rite of Spring, because that's the only part that's interesting. You see all the various different types of dinosaurs. You see this incredible fight between a T-Rex and a Stegosaurus, and it's some of the most photorealistic animation Disney's made so far. But unfortunately, in order to get there, we gotta start from the beginning of everything with the Big Bang, and then slowly progress over millions and millions of years and see how Earth was forming and then cooling, and then watching the very slow evolution from microorganisms all the way up to dinosaurs. And really, by the time we get to the dinosaurs, your eyes are kind of glazed over, and it's really only when that fight happens when you snap out of it and you're like, okay, I'm watching something entertaining. 
And then we get the intermission. It's a little weird for a Disney movie to have an intermission in the first place, but again, they're going for that whole concert hall aesthetic, and I can't fault them for that. But what I can fault them for is the awkward pacing with the live action elements. Now, I don't mind them taking some time to set up the next piece, that's understandable. But when you have to stop the movie cold because some idiot percussionist knocked over the bells, why keep that in? And there's a couple other weird moments like that that happen throughout the movie, and I guess something like that would happen in a live performance, you know, there's always something unexpected. But that's not why people go see live performances. People don't go in thinking, oh, I hope something goes wrong and it makes a lot of noise. That's not really why we're here. And I kind of wish the movie would just focus up and really deliver on the goods, which are these animated segments. But next up, we get Beethoven's Pastoral Symphony, and it's this foray into Greek mythology, and we're up on Mount Olympus with all these mythical creatures. And this is a segment where I really can't make up my mind about it, because I can't say it's boring, because a lot of things are happening. You have a Pegasus family playing with satyrs, you have centaurs coupling, you have a festival with a far too intoxicated Dionysus, and then a climax is with Zeus coming out of the clouds with his lightning bolt, and Ephesus is there forging him for him, and he's just blasting everything, saying, hey, you guys are way too out of control, it's time to bring the party down a little. And as always, the animation is beautiful, they really nail the pastel color palette. But I guess my only gripe is that I feel like it kind of goes on for a bit too long. After the party ends and everyone's kind of calmed down, you'd think that's kind of where it would end. But no, you gotta have Iris with a rainbow and the god of sleep putting everyone to sleep. But then you have the flaming sun chariot of Apollo and the moon with Artemis and her bow. And they bring in a good majority of Olympian gods just in these last few minutes. And I just think it goes on for a little too long. I mean, the party's over, just end it there. Go home. Move on. But once it does move on, we get the Dance of the Hours, and this is a contender, along with Sorcerer's Apprentice and the finale, as the most famous segment in Fantasia, because this is the one where we get the dancing ostriches, hippos, elephants, and crocodiles, and they come together to create a pretty hilarious parody of the Dance of the Hours. Now, Dance of the Hours was incredibly overplayed at the time, and it honestly still could be. I hear it now and then, and you probably hear it more than you think you do. It's just for some reason that ingrained into American culture. So it's no surprise when the animators decide to make a parody of it, like having the most unattractive lumbering animals they could draw as the leads. But not only is the whole parody angle really funny, it also has some of the best slapstick that Fantasia has given us, especially towards the end when the crocodiles start to come into play. But now we made it to the finale, and my favorite part of Fantasia. This finale is really the only reason that I watch Fantasia from time to time because most of it is incredibly boring. But this finale kind of makes up for it because it has the most poignant dichotomy between good and evil that Disney has ever given us. It starts out with the night on Bald Mountain and this incredible design. They actually brought in Bela Lugosi, the actor who played Dracula, to be the model for Chernabog, you know, the devil. And even though they say that his performance didn't really work out and they replaced him with some other guy, I still see elements of Bela Lugosi in this character. And it's this Bald Mountain segment in particular that really does it for me, because not only is the design of Chernabog incredible, but you have these amazing shadows on him and the rest of the mountain and his minions. And there's some really good lighting effects with the flames and the fire, but also with this abandoned ghost town and all the ghosts coming out of it. And it's so surreal and creative. And what is it with Disney giving all the creative stuff to the villains and leaving the heroes just kind of bland and boring? I don't know, but the Bald Mountain segment is just a feast for the senses. It's incredible. But that's not to discount the Ave Maria segment that directly follows. In fact, my favorite moment in all of Fantasia is that transition from Bald Mountain to Ave Maria, where the church bells are going off, and you see Chernabog and his minions just bathed in this heavenly light and terrified of it every time a church bell sounds. And there's a really strong good conquering evil message there that I can get behind. But then the Ave Maria segment kicks up and we're taken into the woods. But then we get the shot that holds the world record for the longest continuous multiplane shot ever achieved. And that is a feat unto itself. But what I really like about Ave Maria is the allusion to God and Christianity and churches through the use of lighting and the shapes of the trees and, you know, and the music instead of just throwing up an image of Mary, which was the original plan. I think they made the right call because it forces you to really take it in and process what you're seeing on another level than if it was just put up there for everyone to see. And that's Fantasia. What did I think about it? It has its moments. 
Is it possible for a movie to do something so well that it becomes bad? Fantasia was never intended to be an average movie going experience. It was made specifically to feel like you were going to a concert and watching the music. And if that's what Walt Disney set out to do, he not only achieved that, he nailed it 100%. All the segments are animated beautifully. They line up perfectly with the music that they're paired with. The use of live action helps to bring you into that environment. And the slow, sometimes monotonous pacing does reflect a concert. So as a concert experience, or just a feat of animation, it's really successful. But in my opinion, where it doesn't succeed is as a movie. Now you can have movies that don't follow a straightforward narrative. You can have movies that are broken up into segments like Pulp Fiction, or even where the segments don't have much to do with each other like the Sin City movies. But in my opinion, Fantasia was so concerned about trying to be an authentic concert experience that it forgot to be a movie. And because of that, the pacing is incredibly slow. I think a lot of the segments could have been shortened. You didn't have to use the entire piece of music. You could have used some of the more interesting movements of them. And I think that would go a long way to make Fantasia more successful as a movie. Because even though I really do respect what Walt Disney was going for, I don't think as a movie it succeeds as much as he wanted it to. And this was strike two for Walt Disney's bankroll. Pinocchio didn't make its money back, and Fantasia certainly didn't make its money back, in part because of the snafu with creating an entirely new surround sound system for the movie theaters that only a handful of them could actually install. So that didn't really help the box office either. But now I turn it over to you guys. What do you think about Fantasia? Do you like the visual concert approach, or does classical music just put you to sleep? Whatever you think, comment below, and if you like this video, be sure to give it a like and subscribe for more content, and hit the notification bell to be notified every time I upload a video. As always, I'm Colby, this is my Nerdy Talk, and I'll see you in the next video.